And so essentially the research was testing this idea that tumors can become addicted to the drugs that we use to treat them. What was discovered was that melanoma cells that were treated with BRAF inhibitors would eventually become resistant. But when you tried to grow these cells in culture with no drug present, they wouldn't grow very well. They had a fitness disadvantage. So the idea is when you take parental cells, cells that are not resistant, the more drug you put with them, the worse they grow. It turns out though, with these resistant cells, they grow poorly at low drug concentrations, just as they do at high drug concentrations. There was that sort of middle ground where they grew optimally. And the thought is that the, 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 the cells simply expand the amount of protein to account for the presence of drugs. They make more protein and, and basically the amount that's not inhibited with the drug present is perfect for growth. And so this was something that seemed to make sense in people because we've seen patients when you give drugs until the disease progresses and then you stop the drug when the tumors will actually regress in the absence of drugs. So it made sense to test in a broader population. And, and, and this was really a preventative strategy to vary the selective pressure. And we think the drugs will work for longer. So we were using dibrafenib and trametinib in patients with BRAF mutated melanoma, typically patients with unresectable or metastatic disease. Dibrafenib is, an, is a BRAF inhibitor, which by itself induces remission in about half of patients. With trametinib, the two drugs together will induce remission in about 70% of patients. Not only does the combination increase the, um, uh, the remission rate, it also makes the remission longer. So the problem with these drugs is they work really well, deep remissions, but they only work for a while. So dibrafenib alone might induce remissions for about six, six months. Uh, the combination might induce remission for 10 months, and then the tumors find a way around it. So basically, we were testing this in a patient population with BRAF-mutated melanoma, where these drugs are the standard of care. And we we're trying to see if taking gaps in therapy would allow these drugs to work for longer. We found out that actually taking gaps in therapy uh, uh, was associated with just shorter period of, of drug efficacy. And this was pretty surprising because there was a lot of preclinical data suggesting that it would actually work. If you look in the clinical trials databases, you'll see that there's at least five different studies in melanoma looking at intermittent dosing of these dr similar drugs. And if you look broadly, there's maybe uh, 70 studies of intermittent dosing trying to address drug addiction. So it's an idea that really has been quite uh, prevalent. And we took this into patients in a real world setting and found the opposite result. And I, we thought that was important. That's not saying that intermittent dosing could never work under any circumstances. It's just saying that if you were to take currently available drugs and put it into practice in a large population base, uh, it, it, it may not work. You may need to really fine tune this to get it to work. It might be very sensitive. And, and part of the problem with that is that in real world practice, it's not a neat, tidy experiment. You know, uh, it, it, people will make changes based on how the patient's doing. If a patient comes into my office and their tumor is growing in an off-treatment period, I'm going to say, oh, geez, we should do something different. We're not comfortable with this. Whereas in a mouse, you'll say, well, we'll wait for the next assessment. We'll just keep treating them and we'll keep on the schedule. Uh, so I think uh, the burden is really on the investigator to design something uh, that's really different that we believe is going to have a different outcome. We can't just use, uh, it, it really, this is a good test of the hypothesis. Uh, but but, um, but uh, it, it requires a lot of fine tuning and a lot of precision if, if we're really gonna get this to work and it may not work. Well, there's a couple pieces of follow-up that I think are important. Uh, we are trying to obtain uh, tissue samples from the patients to understand if there are certain patients who may have benefited uh, from intermittent dosing to see if there's differences in the population. Um, we're looking at circulated tumor DNA information to see if we can get some data from that to understand what, what went on and what did and didn't happen in these patients. Um, so there's a couple things. There's also some interesting phenomena. It turns out the intermittently dosed patients appeared to have longer, the survival of the two groups was similar. So there was no difference in overall survival. Uh, and, and, and the post-progression survival was longer in the intermittently dosed patients. So we'd like to probe into that a little bit more and understand what's going on. Um, I think there will also be a number of studies, like I mentioned, there's a number of studies in progress, and we can sort of see what those uh, find and see if there are any differences between studies based on the drugs and the population. Um, there's different drugs with different parameters, uh, and we may find different results based on the agents used. Uh, some of the most recent agents, binimetinib and encorafenib, actually have a very short half-life. Uh, there's a BRAF and MEK inhibitor combinations, and that might be important, and we, we, it'd be good to see. If, if you don't get an effect with those drugs, then we really have to consider whether this is going to work in patients ever. 
Um, so one of the hypotheses is that in order to get the, the, the um, resistant cells to die, you need to withdraw a drug quickly. And one of the problems we had on this study was trametinib has a very long half-life of four days. And so you couldn't get a quick drug withdrawal even if you stopped the agents. It's possible if you used agents with a very short half-life, you would get a much faster withdrawal uh, and it might be more effective. So for instance, uh, results from that study would be interesting. Maybe if you see a very rapid withdrawal of drug causes uh, more durable uh, responses in intermittently dosed patients, that would say that maybe that was the problem. So there's a lot of data that should be forthcoming that should help us to understand what went on. So one of the things that's really interesting that people may or may not think about is actually the half-life, the, the, the way the drugs are metabolized in the mouse is different than the way they're metabolized in people. And it could be that the mouse eliminates the drug much more quickly. Maybe that was really important for the, the preclinical studies to work. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's been pointed out is that the mouse may be more, uh, the mice may be more similar, uh, the cancer we start with. It may be that, um, that uh, the, uh, the tumors are more complex in people than they are, are in mice. So if you do a mouse study, the mouse may have each mouse may have a very similar resistance mechanism going on that's causing the tumors to grow. So if you do one intervention, it'll work for all of the mice, perhaps. In patients, there may be a whole bunch of different resistance mechanisms that are at play, and it may be that one size doesn't fit all. I think that this is, for me, this is an important part of a conversation about how we model human disease. And so that for people doing mouse work, the question is, how do we apply this in the clinic? From this, and what do we still not know when we're done with the experiment? Um, so I think it's a, a back and forth um, endeavor. We should be, to the degree possible, taking the information from the clinic. If we have some patient uh, biopsy data that we can use to understand what's going on, that's really, really important. Go back and model it in the laboratory and then uh, and try to get some more details and then try to understand the limits of those models as we bring it back to clinic. And so that will help us to make the best choices for our patients. Ultimately, what happens in patients is what really matters for making treatments better. Uh, and so just being aware of, of what we know and what we still need to know as we make those human studies is really important.